Warning, the following podcast contains extravagant profanities like multisyllabic fucks and whatnot. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Mint Mobile, Factor, and by the new wall-safe ketchup for childish tirades, Condo Mints. Condo Mints. Because your crowd sizes are bigger than yours. By like, by like a lot. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hello, Scathing Atheist listeners. My name is Shy Pirate. I don't have a website. I don't have a podcast. But I'm coming to you today to remind you, no, beg you, get registered and vote in November. As entertaining as it is, we don't need Heath repeatedly telling us who we should have voted for for the next four years. And truly, if we fuck this up, it will quickly become all too evident that we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men. It's August 22nd. And it's World Plant Milk Day. Hey, just have black coffee like a grown-up. Come on. Testify. We have it's already one. vegan. Raw dog that coffee. I'm no illusions. I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Heath Enright. And from Echo and the Bunny Men's Liverpool, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is the Skating East. On this week's episode, British cops will pay you for your thought crimes. Marjorie Taylor Greene reminds us that we need a center for Congress people who can't read good. And we'll get our most topical who's woo yet. But first, the diatribe. All right, I get that I've already dedicated two different diatribes to whether or not you should capitalize the G in God. And I know I did one of them pretty recently. So it's it, like I'm at risk of making this seem like an obsession. I know. But I kind of have to talk about it again because I recently encountered an example that perfectly encapsulates why I have such an issue with Strunk and White when it comes to this topic. So last weekend, I'm watching an idiotic movie for our sister show, God Awful Movie. It's, it's about a cocaine dealer who's all immoral and secular, but then he gets caught and he goes to jail and he finds Jesus. But before all that happens, while he's still an evil atheist, he and a drug runner that works for him are talking about their burgeoning cocaine market in China, and they have this ridiculous exchange. The drug runner says, quote, cocaine is like the new god to these people, end quote. And his boss, the main character, responds, quote, we don't believe in God, so that's okay, end quote. Now, for a discussion on what a profoundly silly thing that is to say, I'm going to have to refer you over to episode 470 of God Awful Movies. But for our purposes here, the only thing that matters about the exchange is the capitalization of the word God. Because as I'm transcribing it, it occurs to me that this perfectly encapsulates the problem with the existing convention on this, right? Because if we're following the letter of the grammatical law, we don't capitalize the G the first time around, right? When the drug runner says it, when the guy goes, cocaine is the new God of these people. But we do capitalize it the second time when the boss says, we don't believe in God. Now, set aside for a second that this was written by a person so inept Gutenberg would wish he had just taken up fishing or something. Obviously, this ridiculous exchange would never happen in real life. But that's beside the point. What this hack-ass writer has accidentally done is provided this perfect example of the way modern English flows back and forth in its use of the word God. Right? Because the first guy is talking about God in the sense of generic object of supreme worship i.e. this guy's God is baseball or she treats her boyfriend like a God. The second guy is talking about Jesus's dad, right? Or at least that's what the capitalization convention would have you believe. Now, of course, he's not making a statement on the supremacy of one God or the other. In fact, he's doing the exact opposite. He's saying he doesn't believe in any God. The way we express that in modern English is I don't believe in God rather than I don't believe in God's but it's intended to express the same thing. The fact that the convention is singular is really just an outgrowth of the times when you could still get burned alive for acknowledging that Christian God was on the same level as all the heathen ones, right? So all this bullshit about capitalizing the G because it's a proper noun is out the fucking window at this point. And yet so-called proper English wouldn't allow for this. The word God refers to a concept here, a concept meant to encompass all God claims, not just the monotheistic ones. And yet the standard linguistic convention insists that we treat the concept as an individual with a name. And look, I get that this might not seem like it matters, Right. I mean, I spend a lot more time writing the word God than most atheists. So I'm sure 
like, you know, it's less of a day to day concern for most people, but it does matter. It matters because language subtly reprograms the way we think. That was the whole fucking point of Newspeak in 1984. Right. If we take away the word freedom, then it'll make it harder for people to talk about and think about. And, and, and if we conflate lowercase God with uppercase God, we make it harder for people to distinguish the two. Think about that in terms of apologetics. Right. If you've ever spent any time at all listening to Christians try to justify their religion, you'll notice that they spend an awful lot of time trying to prove things that have nothing to do with Jesus's dad. Right. They'll spend a whole fucking debate trying to prove that something must have created the universe as though that would imply the existence of their God. As though proving the universe had an antecedent would get us within striking distance of their theology. It also happens when they're called upon to defend their God, right? Suddenly all the specifics can melt away and God just becomes some slippery concept or primacy. Now, all of those specifics will suddenly rematerialize as soon as it's time to deny rights to gay people or subjugate women or whatever. Suddenly that vague concept will turn back into a dude who wrote a book. But the instant we start pointing out the contradictions in the book, he'll be back to a concept that just inspired the book instead. This isn't always a malicious trick that Christians are pulling on us because we've done so much to linguistically conflate the concept of God and the specifics of their God. They often don't have the ability to think of those as two distinct things. And that's a point worth dwelling on. Right. When we fail to capitalize the G in God, we're often accused of being disrespectful to religious people. But it seems way more disrespectful to me to reduce their God to a generic concept. Right. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the tomato and tomato to my ketchup. Heath Enright and Michael Marshall. Fellas, are you ready to call the whole thing off? Uh, ketchup as a concept? Yeah, let's call that off. OK, OK. So, like, I'm 90% sure that's a reference, but I, uh, I couldn't tell you the source. Oh. <laughs> Not even with hindsight. <laughs> All right, well, well, Heath's making me feel low, bro, and Marsh is making me feel old. So we're going to pause for a quick weep and a word from this week's first sponsor, Mint Mobile. <sighs> Hello? Hey, Marsh, it's Heath. Heath, do you have any idea what time it is in England right now? Uh, time zones are a myth, Marsh, like centrifugal force and abiding happiness. Everybody knows that. Oh, okay, well, it's still very late here. Okay, just a quick question. How do I find my mother's maiden name's equivalent in Welsh heraldry? Why would you think I'd know that? Because the accent, duh, obviously. <sighs> Why do you need that? To switch over to a new phone plan. I've already answered the math section and the essay portion, but this last section of the questionnaire is really hard. Oh, well, Heath, if you want to save money by switching phone plans without all the BS, why don't you try Mint Mobile? What's Mint Mobile? Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save on your wireless bill. With Mint Mobile, you can get unlimited talk and text for just 15 bucks a month. And the longest part of the process for switching will be the time you spend breaking up with your old provider. Huh. So no need to get an astrological chart on at all? Nope. For this or anything else, really. Okay. To get started, go to mintmobile.com slash scathing, and there you'll see that right now, all three-month plans are only $15 a month, including the unlimited plan. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Wait a second, your nation or mine? Oh, yours. Nice. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your existing phone number along with your existing contacts. Find out how easy it is to switch to Mint Mobile and get three months of premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. All right, Marsh, I'm sold. How do I sign up? To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash scathing. That's mintmobile.com slash scathing. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash scathing. $45 upfront payment required equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Noah, what are you doing here? Oh, the, the other phone contract required a co-signer. Got it. And now back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight... The Oklahoma Statewide Charter School Board has formally rescinded its contract with the St. Isidore of Seville Catholic Virtual School, ending the drama over whether Oklahoma would be the first U.S. state to open a fully taxpayer-funded religious school. They won't, at least not this time. 
And all it took to convince the board was warning them in advance that it was illegal and then warning them again after they did it anyway and then suing them and then winning that lawsuit and then winning the appeal seven to one by the state Supreme Court in a ruling that pointed out the board's decision violated state law, federal law and both state and federal constitutions and then threatening them with six months in jail time and a five hundred dollar fine if they failed to abide by the Supreme Court's ruling, which they weren't doing. Those six simple steps were all it took to get a band of Oklahoma and <laughs> Christian nationalists to vote to rescind the contract provisionally. We'll see. Yeah, right. So they still reserve the right to reinstate it immediately if the SCOTUS overturns the state Supreme Court's ruling. Yeah. It's the kid clearly losing the fight and being like, I'll stop if you stop. I'll stop if you stop. <laughs> except, <laughs> except the kid lost the fight six times already. Yep. And he's saying like, I'll stop if you stop, but my dad is totally on the way. And then and then maybe we start again, depending on if your right, dad shows yeah. up and how big he is compared to my dad. And his dad is six bigots in robes, as it turns out. In this case. <laughs> right. Black robes instead of white ones, but the effect is about the same. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure change in the color of the robe is proposed in Project 2025. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. And the hoods, that just makes it easier for the justices to think without distraction. There That's you go. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. So, of course, we've been covering this story for a while now. It first came up back on episode 538, and we've been following along for more than a year as this disastrously bad decision has wound its way through the courts and throughout all of it, an unlikely champion for church-state separation has arisen in the form of loony, toonsily named Oklahoma Attorney General Gentner Drummond. Gentner Drummond? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I forgot about his name. The Republican Christian Oklahoman has been a vociferous opponent of the school since it was first proposed, and he's expended considerable political capital to fight it. And sure, he's an unlikely hero for a secularism story, but with a name like Gettner Drummond, he's an unlikely person in any role but the unfaithful lover in a Gilded Age romance. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't even say Gettner Drummond in my head without my hands instinctively snapping my suspenders that I'm not wearing. <laughs> they just go right to it. Thumbs go right in. Yep, yep. Yeah, sure he's, he's got the name of a man that you'd find in a history textbook whose views are being excused as, well, it was a different time back then. Right, yes, <laughs> exactly. So anyway, I'd love to say that this will be our final update to the story, but it's still Oklahoma. And after the state Supreme Court ordered these assholes to overturn their decision, it still took Drummond threatening them with fines and jail time for them to even follow that fucking order. And the diocese that stood to benefit from this largesse has vowed to appeal the decision to the SCOTUS. And this SCOTUS has never met a private religious institution it didn't want to give taxpayer money to. So all I can say is that it should be the last time we update this story, which was also true of all the other times we updated this fucking story, too. Yep. Yeah. And in the right race at the riot time news, it's just over two weeks since race riots gripped the UK, where far right thugs high on misinformed conspiracy theories and cheap cocaine attacked Muslim populations around the country for the sin of being fans of the wrong imaginary deity while in possession of criminal levels of melanin. Mm -hmm. And look, I know Eli touched on it during a recent Skeptocrat, but as your UK correspondent, I, I still have a couple of things I want to add. Okay, well, but first and foremost, uh, how cheap is the cocaine? <laughs> Do you know the guy? Okay, so what might not be fully clear from the coverage, but what was very clear from being at some of the counter-protests in person is that these riots were inextricably linked to Christian nationalist conspiracies like the Great Replacement Theory. The idea that white Christians in the UK are under threat from an imagined invasion of radical Muslims who are here to take away the future of our white children. Right, which is ironic because the, the thing that's really doing that is far-right Christian nationalists. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> in several ways, including the fact that being a Christian nationalist white guy who says karate all the time is <laughs> definitely going to help you with, you know, breeding you out of existence. Yes, right. Yeah. It, it's the Cobra Kai effect. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously... I've got major issues with Islamic doctrine and the teachings of the Quran. But as skeptics and atheists and humanists, our place here should be side by side with the people who are just trying to exist and live their life, but whose otherness has made them a target by people trying to stir up hate and division, especially when that hate and division itself comes tinged with religious supremacy. 
At one counter protest, I saw a guy carrying a seven foot tall wooden cross daubed with slogans while the crowd chanted, Allah, Allah, who the fuck is Allah? Oh, uh, yikes. And I don't care how many new atheist books you read in the early 2000s. If you can't tell which side of that protest is the good guys and which is the bad guys, you missed the memo on how to be a good skeptic. Well, yeah, and, and on how to be a good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're getting be an atheist wrong. It's so easy. It's, it's so just, easy. It's a not thing. It's so easy. One of the early flashpoints was the Abdullah Quilliam Center, the oldest mosque in the UK, which is right here in Liverpool, where I live. The mosque was built by a 19th century convert to Islam who was actually born William Quilliam. Come on. And who possibly changed <laughs> religions just so he could get rid of a name that made him sound like the main character in a poorly drafted children's book. <laughs> yeah. Most of that guy's life was yelling, it's pronounced Kiyayim, assholes. <laughs> <laughs> William William and his silly umbrella. Yeah, no, it's good. I, you yeah. know he just converted to Islam to spite his parents. He was like, really? We're the Quilliams and you named me William? It's the one thing that rhymes? I'm yep. Muslim now. <laughs> Fuck you. Thankfully, people spotted that the far right were targeting that mosque and they shared the threat with local anti-fascist groups. And so the counter-protesters who turned up hugely outnumbered the anti-immigrant rally. And if not for them, the whole situation could have gone very badly. Pretty telling that the solution wasn't to tip the police off, though, about this. Yeah. Right? yeah. And look, while a major incident was averted, I do want to salute Adam Kellick, the mosque's imam, because rather than stay inside the mosque and understandably prioritize his own safety, he came outside with trays of hot food and drinks, which he brought to the rioters, taking the chance to actually talk to them and more importantly, to listen to them. Wow. And what he found was that rather than being people who had a boiling hatred for Muslims, some of the rioters he spoke to were angry and scared and confused, and they'd been lied to as to who was to blame. And Adam ended the night hugging one of the main agitators and inviting him back to the mosque to talk some more. Okay, that's an impressive human quality that I am incapable of summoning. <laughs> <laughs> that's a virtue though, wow. Yeah, he was seriously impressive. Like I'm going in for that hug and then my brain is going to snap and I'm doing like a headbutt or a dick punch or right, something. Yes, yeah. Right, yes, <laughs> yeah. And then the next day when rioters were causing violence and mayhem in Liverpool City Centre, that same rioter that Adam hugged was seen shielding a young Muslim from the carnage. Okay, that's a great story and everything, but wait until nine months from now when we make you watch a fucking movie about this, Mark. Okay? <laughs> it's going to be awful by then. But at least it'd be awful in Scouse accents and therefore yeah. totally worth it. <laughs> yeah, that is worth it. So I actually saw Adam speaking the day after the riots where he explained how important it is that we talk to people and hear them out and reassure them because they are human just like us. And he explained that when we write people off, it just makes them easier for bad faith actors to manipulate them. And as the guy who spent half his podcasting career listening to people that others write off, I could not have put it better myself. Like our podcast style also changes the world and saves people. Merch. We're tied for changing the world and saving people. <laughs> yeah, or we're not. But I'm a spiteful person and spite is way more fun. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that too. So I just want to say hats off to Adam Kelwick for his compassionate, reasonable stance. And uh, Adam, if you ever want to apply some of that reason to the whole winged horse deal, I'll be there with some <laughs> hot drinks and some sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and in Preaching to the Wire news, former Trump cabinet <laughs> member and Project 2025 leader Russell Vaught sat down in a fancy hotel suite in Washington, D.C. last month with two men representing a wealthy conservative donor and Vought was hoping to secure a big donation check. So he launched into a long speech about his amazing behind-the-scenes work setting up a Christian right battle plan for Donald Trump if he wins. That includes expanding presidential power and then, of course, abusing it, um, getting rid of pornography entirely somehow, <laughs> carrying out a massive deportation, and he mentioned his very strong opinion that the Republican Party is being too liberal because they, they focus on religious liberty instead of outright Christian states of America. And we know all of that stuff because the two men on the other side of the table were undercover British journalists from a nonprofit group called the Center for Climate Reporting. <laughs> and they had a recording device going the whole time. 
Okay, as someone who has been that undercover journalist with a secret recorder in the past, my advice is just assume that anytime you're in a meeting with a British person, we're recording you. Like, <laughs> I'm recording this conversation right now. Oh, sh- <laughs> how dare you? Morgan, edit out the fact that Marsh is recording. <laughs> <laughs> An exchange like that might as well have happened at this ridiculous thing. It's awesome. (laughs) Right, yeah. And a big thanks to Bart for sending us the link to scathingnews at gmail.com. So as far as I can tell, the delightful sting began when Vaught walked into the hotel suite and the two British men introduced themselves as, you know, normal, typical American Joes who like the cut of his jib. They (laughs) probably, I don't know why they said it in like the black comedian doing a white guy voice, but... That's how I picture it. One of them then added something like, yeah, just make sure you speak into the uh, cartoonishly oversized carnation on my 10-gallon hat that I have because uh, I don't hear so well. And of course, that carnation had a camera and a microphone inside, by which, I mean, they already had the entire suite wired ahead of time. And just to sell the American lunatic story extra hard, they asked Vaught if they could begin the meeting with a prayer. And Vaught very happily bowed his head, and prayed to the omniscient God of the universe during a sting that he wasn't aware of, (laughs) exposing the corrupt political crusade of that God's adherence. Oh, God, that has got to be so embarrassing for God to have his team caught out on tape like that. Because making a note of your worst secrets in order to use them against you is literally his whole deal. (laughs) (laughs) It's also, it's such a challenge to Christian God, right? It's like, hey, bet you can't warn your boy, right? (laughs) (laughs) So the full video of this encounter got published last week, and it's just aggressively evil. It's like Vaught was part of a sketch about about the leader of Project 2025 getting caught in a sting. Yeah. Within minutes, he said the word secret about a dozen times. That includes his description of how he's been secretly drafting hundreds of executive orders for Trump to carry out right away if he does win. Vought described the overall strategy as, quote, creating shadow agencies. Uh-huh. And he even narked directly on Donald Trump. Trump's been claiming that he's not involved with Project 2025, but... According to Vaught, Trump has, quote, blessed the project and is, quote, very supportive of what we do. Yeah, they stopped just short of showing off the copy that they got Trump to sign for them, where he turned the O in 2025 into a little love heart. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So wait, so to be clear about the substance here, their problem with the imaginary deep state was that they did not have one of their own. I just want to emphasize (laughs) this. That is correct. (laughs) Jesus. And here's the response we got following the horribly damning expose. According to a spokesperson for Vought's foundation, quote, it would have been easier to just do a Google search to uncover what's already on our website and said in countless national media interviews, but thank you for airing our perfect conversation. (laughs) Emphasizing our policy work is totally separate from the Trump campaign, as we have been saying. I'm sorry. So they they went with the no defense. <laughs> they did, just directly lying in ways that got pre contradicted by the expose that yes. they were responding to just now. <laughs> yeah. So, bottom line: cheers to the Center for Climate Reporting. <laughs> According to CNN, this sort of elaborate ruse doesn't get used very often by American liberal journalists, but it's finally starting to catch on. And this is by far my favorite. UK export. Five stars. And Marsh, tell your boys I'm such a big fan. Such a boy. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess while Marsh thanks England on our behalf, we're going to pause for a word from our other sponsor this week, Factor. We don't know this wasn't Marsh. They blurred out the faces <laughs> oh, so that they could keep doing their undercover work. I'm saying nothing. I'm saying absolutely nothing. Interesting. Take that as you will. Hmm? Hey, Noah, you ready to get back to the record? Uh, One second, just needed down a tube of caloric ingestion paste. Ooh, sounds not great. No, it's not. But it's the only way to eat healthy with the amount of free time I can spare, you know? Well, if you want to meet your wellness goals without sacrificing taste, why not try Factor? They have options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Their fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great-tasting meals. 
Well, but don't those meals get a little samey? Compared to caloric ingestion paste. It comes in 11 flavors, Marsh. 11 flavors or 11 colors? No comment. Yeah, colors. So uh, with Factor, you get plenty of variety. With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore. Make your day delicious. From breakfast to dessert, stay fueled with easy, nutritious options. I don't know, Heath. Do they have restaurant-quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon? They sure do. Well, that sounds amazing. How do I sign up? Head to factormeals.com slash scathing50 and use the code scathing50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code scathing50 at factormeals.com slash scathing50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Awesome. Hold on, wait a second. Did we just get all the way through a factor ad with Marsh without making a joke about how bad British food is? Well, I mean, Hmm. almost. Yeah, you almost did. There it is. Oh, yeah. And in crime never praise news, I'm not sure if you saw the news, but the UK government has made it illegal to even think about God and will send out a roving force of professional thought crime detectors to haul you to prison if a theological notion so much as flickers across your brain. Or so you'd think if you read the recent headlines about Isabel Vaughan Spruce, the Christian who was arrested for silently praying in public. How dare you get my hopes up like that, Marsh? (laughs) Yeah, I'm so excited. I actually had a dream about this, but instead of the cops showing up, every time somebody did a thought crime or did anything illogical in their face, they got flicked in the eyeball by a cartoon ghost. I think it happened a lot. Nice. So here's the story. In 2023, Vaughn Spruce was arrested for praying in a protest exclusion zone outside of an abortion clinic. Police turned up to ask her, you know, why are you loitering outside of a medical facility? And despite her insistence that she wasn't protesting, she was just thinking, but religiously, which is kind of the opposite of that. Yeah. The police (laughs) arrested her anyway. And then this week, she received an official apology and compensation from the police. Wow. (sighs) Our cops don't even do that when they shoot you to death for no reason. (laughs) Nope. So like this all might seem pretty odd and it's certainly been portrayed by parts of the media as if the government had employed professional mind readers to scan the entire country for double plus ungood faults. (laughs) But that is not what's actually happening here. All right. I'll fire up the time machine and pick up Orwell for a side tackle. Somebody is going to need one for sure. Sure. Yeah. So Vaughn Spruce is a director of the anti-abortion group March for Life and also of 40 Days for Life. And those have been picketing abortion clinics for more than a decade. They hand out leaflets or shout slogans and hold up signs and print out giant pictures of what they think aborted fetuses look like. They'd even hand out baby clothes to women going into these facilities. And that was obviously very intimidating to people who were just trying to get medical care or even just the people who were just trying to get to where they work. So the government introduced buffer zones around the clinics to ensure that people have got access without fear of confrontation. Okay, so this is the fucking not touching, can't get mad level of abortion clinic protest. Sure is, yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, I feel like that means we're allowed to cover you with a big dome now, right? Like, <laughs> like a drone flies over and just like slowly lowers a big silver cloche over the top of the harassment squad. We're also not touching. And then we're allowed to, you know, move you around like we caught a spider under right, a Right, no, like, yeah, exactly. Slide, we slide you know, in a card underneath yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so this wasn't so much that she was arrested for a thought crime, as it's been reported by countless pro-Christian voices who want to pretend the sky's fallen in. It's actually that she was from a protest group that's intimidated people for years to the point where laws were introduced specifically to stop them being able to do that, And then she still broke those laws. And yeah, like, obviously, it's silly that she could be arrested for silently talking to her imaginary friend. But here's a question for Vaughn Spruce. If this really is just about silent prayer, why do you need to do it directly outside of an abortion clinic? Sure. Great question. Isn't your God meant to be literally everywhere? (laughs) Does he need to be within a certain distance of the target? Like, does he operate via Bluetooth? (laughs) Or or does he need a visual aid? Like he's, oh, that abortion (laughs) clinic. Gotcha. Yeah, God's a stickler about the shotgun rules. You have to see the pregnant person. 
or else God lets them do a murder. Well, That's right. Yeah. About right. The rules if thing. God thinks that abortion is baby murder, as you claim, why the fuck does he need your prayer to remind him to intervene at all? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, right. This clinic, the one you're, are you close? The one you're close to? God, okay. okay, okay. <laughs> I got to know what they smell like. Yeah, like, obviously, the reason she wants to do her praying outside of abortion clinics isn't so her God can see the clinic. It's so the clinic and its patients can see her. Mm -hmm. Especially while she stood there in best case scenario, silent, glaring, intimidatory judgment. And just flip the tables here. If somebody spent their time standing outside of her bigot office, staring at her whenever she came out, she'd be creeped out and intimidated as well. That's what this is all about. Obviously. Yeah. Right, no, like, I bet I could go get arrested real quick for just standing outside of a church staring at everybody as they walked in, <laughs> right? And that's before I start mouthing silent pseudo-Latin. Yeah, I this could do right. so many things while I'm also, quote, silently praying. Right? There's so many crimes you can do. You're a real multitasker, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Chew gum, walk around, crime you. <laughs> And look, if you're tempted to consider her the David to the oppressive government's Goliath, you should also bear in mind that her appeal and the case where she took the police to court was funded by the Alliance Defending Freedom, mm. the American conservative Christian organization that pushes an anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ plus agenda. Her lawyer, Jeremiah Iganabola, works for the ADF, and he criticized her arrest, saying, quote, we must now ask ourselves whether we are a genuinely democratic nation committed to protecting the peaceful exercise of the right to freedom of speech, unquote. Uh, quick thing, Jeremiah. Freedom of speech? I thought her whole argument was that she wasn't speaking. Oh. That she was prosecuted <laughs> for just for what was happening inside her head. You literally just showed us your hand there. Didn't you, though? Yeah. Well, and another thing to consider if you want to make a fucking martyr out of her is that she won the fucking case. She did, yeah. Right? The government that's supposedly oppressing her ultimately agreed with her? Yeah. Maybe just have the cops be silently praying while they do the arrests from now on. And <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, so that makes it fine. So yeah, while I believe nobody should be banned from thinking things and being places, or even from sending silent prayers to a god or silent Christmas lists to a Santa, we also shouldn't <laughs> kid ourselves as to what's going on here. This isn't a brave warrior standing up to government thought police. It's a well-funded right-wing velociraptor testing the fences mm -hmm. and looking for weaknesses in the UK's protections for abortion rights. And we have to show them that there aren't any. Well said. And finally tonight, in putting the cell phone in cell phone news. <laughs> <laughs> well done. U.S. Congressperson Marjorie Taylor Greene doesn't really know how to read. Mm -mm. And she made that extra clear this week when she got on her phone and tweeted a link to an article with a comment that said the opposite of what the article was explaining. And it's all bad news. Bad news part one. Well, we have a sitting congressperson who can't really read. <laughs> we actually have a bunch, I'm sure, but they weren't in the headlines this week, but her for sure. And even if they were in the headlines, they'd have no way of knowing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and bad news part two, the Supreme Court ruled that red states can continue doing all the gender discrimination in violation of the new Title IX regulations while they have legal battles about one particular part of the new Title IX that's based on their transphobia. The highest court in the land ruled that a transphobic freakout is an official timeout on all the anti-discrimination rules. Yeah, but like if it wasn't that, they'd have said fucking Shark Week or the Toyota Thon was grounds for an official timeout on all the anti-discrimination <laughs> rules. Like nice. the timeouts on anti-discrimination rules are their whole fucking thing at this point. That's right? yeah. what they do. So the ruling in question denied an appeal from the Biden administration that was seeking to prevent bigot states, 26 of them from continuing to violate the new Title IX regulations that added anti-discrimination protections in schools, including protections for the rights of parenting and pregnant students. But there were also protections for the LGBTQ plus community. So Christian right bigots, of course, filed lawsuits to block the new regulations and protect the religious right of taking rights. And they succeeded in many lower level cases, achieving injunctions against the enforcement of the new rules. So the appeal from the Biden administration was basically just saying, hey, Supreme Court, we get it. They're bigots. 
in more than half the states. But don't let them scrap the entire new Title IX. Just uphold the parts about parenting and pregnant students for now, while the absurd lawsuits about pronoun fascism go through the legal system. And the Supreme Court ruled, fuck nuance. Most of us are bigots, too. We're the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the ruling, the entire new Title IX, including all the protections for predominantly cishet women and girls, will continue being unenforceable. Okay, but why did they stop there? You know, they've already suspended one law because part of it is disputed. But then why should the other laws still be in place while this one law is being debated? Really? I say the, the only fair thing is to put all law in America on hold and just go full purge until the Supreme Court get over their weird aversion to pronouns. <laughs> but honestly, if you suspend all laws and give Eli like an address book and a weekend off, I reckon the Supreme Court would find the motivation pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. No, but I, I believe their official statement on this was, quote, you thought you were going to appeal to our better nature by pointing out that we're harming pregnant people? Are you fucking <laughs> kidding me? Yeah. End quote. Yeah. Okay, and here's how the part with MTG happened. As part of her job on exactly zero committees, Madge Tajgadge was scrolling through neo-Nazi memes with her freedom phone on Patriot Mobile, I'm sure, and she came across an article about the recent Supreme Court ruling about Title IX. Actually, she didn't even come across an article. She came across a professional neo-Nazi memer who posted about the article incorrectly because of a similar literacy problem, and MTG retweeted that with her comment. Yeah, and given that literacy issue and the fact it's in Roman numerals, I'm pretty sure both MTG and Libs of TikTok both read it as a title X rule <laughs> and then thought, you know, trans people make me feel ick because I'm a terrible <laughs> bigot, so I assume no. this must be about that. <laughs> And just for the record, this wasn't even just a case of reading the headline without reading the article. It's worse than that. It's worse than that incredibly stupid, very pervasive problem with modern society. Even without reading the article itself, which MTG clearly isn't doing, just from the headline, it's very clear that the ruling denied a partial reinstatement of the new Title IX regulations. And then if you have the attention span to read one or two sentences, you learn how the ruling allowed Republicans to continue making things worse for girls and women. But Madge is an idiot. So she immediately sent the retweet along with the comment, great victory for girls and women with two exclamation points. She's double excited because fuck the pregos. Is that? <laughs> yeah, something like that. So the ruling was five to four with Neil Gorsuch joining sanity, but only on a technicality. He's against the new Title IX protections, but he's even more against the lower courts granting injunctions that are a little too broad for him. That's the line in the sand he's landing oh. on. Or, and it really feels like this is how it works, or the conservative majority knows they can have one person defect and still win five to four, and they do this on purpose. They play like one potato, two potato, and pick that one person, and it looks like they're not just voting for Christianity as a block every yeah. single time. But yeah, yes, yeah. they are. And the result is the same either way. In this case, the timeout power of a transphobic legal freakout got upheld at the expense of mostly cis women. I'm starting to think the Christian right has a problem with just, you know, women in general. It's hard to say with all the clever subterfuge they're doing, but that's my <laughs> wild guess. There might be a little misogyny in there. Weird. And and with that reminder that the supermajority of our Supreme Court has a system now where they take turns being honest, we're going to wrap up the headlines for the night. Heath Marsh, thanks as always, slash sometimes. Jumaji. And when we come back, we'll see what happens when Marsh expands fuck that guy into 2,500 words. When someone tells you they're a professional skeptic, the appropriate response is skepticism. After all, there aren't many, but we're lucky enough to have one with us again today, so we're going to pick his brain with another installment of Who's Woo? So, Marsh, who are we going to be talking about today? Okay. In my most recent wanders through the hall of arseholes that is Who's Woo, I've guided you down the corridors populated by figures who've been, at least one point in their lives, sincere in their bullshit, only to slip the guardrails and become a fully blown public menace. But 
lest listeners think I'm some sort of bleeding heart liberal and come by our hippie who thinks there's good in everybody. From time to time, I've got to take you through the other door and remind you of the people who are unambiguously, incontrovertibly, and irredeemably bad. Which is why this week in Who's Woo, we're going to talk about Tommy Robinson. Oh, yeah, so that nobody thinks Marsh is a hippie. (laughs) Good. Close one. Good. So Stephen Christopher Yaxley Lennon was born in Luton in November 1982 to an English father and an Irish immigrant mother. I stress the latter for irony's sake alone, because Mm -hmm. it will be quite ironic and important. He left school at 16 and got a qualification in aircraft repair at Luton Airport, but lost his job after drunkenly assaulting a police officer and going to prison. The criminal conviction meant that he's now forever banned from working at any airports due to security restrictions brought in after 9-11. So the fact that indirectly Muslims are genuinely to blame for the loss of his career is another thing (laughs) that I'm going to stress for irony. Yeah, good reminder. Never forget, Tommy. (laughs) (laughs) So out of prison and with his career lost, he joined a local football hooligan crew, the Luton Town MIGs or Men in Gear. Though in his case, a more accurate label would have probably have been men on gear, for Yaxley Lennon would go on to film himself boasting about his cocaine use in countries around the world. And in 2014, he was convicted of intent to supply. Um, we're going to stick another ironic pin in that. Well, this, this motherfucker's just an absolute irony pin cushion, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he absolutely is. And while in the Luton MIGs, he used pseudonyms to try to evade justice. He called himself Wayne King because it sounded like Wang King. I don't think, I don't think no illusions or Heath Enright can make any jokes about that at all. Marsh moving on. (laughs) Good point. Eventually, though, he settled on Tommy Robinson. Jack Mehoff. Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, he he eventually settled on Tommy Robinson, which was actually the name of a former member of the group who'd recently hung up his Doc Martens. And his thinking was, if his actions reached the police, instead, they'd come for the other guy. <laughs> <That's how it laughs> works. I don't I don't think that rises to the level of thinking. I don't want to quibble over your word choice there, Marsh. But okay. <laughs> All right, guys, if I get in trouble, the cops have to speak with everybody named Thomas Robinson in the entire country. And that'll <laughs> buy me some time because I'm monitoring all of them. <laughs> also, uh, just thinking it through, um, I'm... Mr. British guy from now on. (laughs) Mr. British. Well, that Luton hooligan firm were not the only group that Tommy Robinson slash Stephen Yaxley then was drawn to. He was also a member of the far-right British National Party, and he founded the anti-Muslim English Defence League, whose issue with Muslims was more about the colour of their skin than the content of their doctrine. Okay, well, for the English Defence League, I am a swarthy threat to their race. (laughs) Vanilla bean is a swarthy threat. <laughs> in 2011, Tommy was sentenced to a 12-month community order for inciting a 100-person brawl outside of a football match and banned from EDL rallies, a ban he immediately breached and then was sent to prison. According to Tommy, going to prison for breaking his don't do this again or you'll go to prison order made him a political prisoner, which he and the EDL milk for press attention and for donations from his supporters. At one point, he even claimed to be on hunger strike for a few days because he believed that the prison food was halal and so he refused to eat it, according to him. <laughs> Wait, what? What? So, so Islamophobes can only eat pork? Is that how that works? <laughs> okay, just... Bleed on the food and it's haram again. There you or go. Like, yeah. Do a counter spell. It's all made up. It's all fake. Yeah. <laughs> and in 2013, Toby Robinson actually left the EDL, apparently because of the group's extremist fringes that he was suddenly worried about. And in an odd coincidence, he actually announced his departure in a press conference that was organized by the Quilliam Foundation which was named after that same William Quilliam who founded the mosque that Robinson's followers attacked weeks ago in Liverpool. Kiyayam, Marsh. Yeah, the Kiyayam Foundation was run by (laughs) none other than Majid Nawaz. There it is. And according to Tommy Robinson, Nawaz's organisation paid him £2,000 per month so that they could claim the credit for him leaving the EDL. Now, that's a, a claim that Quilliam denied. And between Robinson and Nawaz, it's really hard to choose who to disbelieve. Yeah. yeah. No, my, I'm over here in like in a sea of floating calculus equations trying to figure out how they're both lying here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, if we put them both inside a box of poison and never look, that's something unrelated. That sounds fun. That I just no, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> it does sound fun. So this was actually part of Robinson's attempt to reinvent himself. You know, he apologized for calling Muslims terrorists. He disavowed violence. He even informed the police on members of the EDL. And if Tommy's vault fast seems sudden, there's a detail that might offer some context because the 2012 trial of Norwegian neo-Nazi Anders Breivik revealed that his terrorist manifesto repeatedly credits Robinson's EDL as his inspiration Ooh. in between explanations of how Muslims and people of color were being deliberately migrated into white majority countries in order to destabilize and disempower the white race. So the group that represented Tommy Robinson's life's work was getting a shout out in the murder trial of a notorious neo-Nazi terrorist flanked by great replacement paranoia. Yeah, and he's over here going like, wait a second, advocating for white supremacy can lead to violence? Why didn't you assholes warn me? <laughs> yeah. Fuck, I'm in a neo-Nazi bibliography again. Ah, And lots of Ibid, god damn it. <laughs> <laughs> So Anders Breivik even attended multiple EDL demonstrations. He was a member of the EDL's online forum, and he was Facebook friends with 600 of their members, including senior leaders. So when your English Defence League is recruiting Norwegian neo-Nazis, it's not foreigners per se that you hate, is it? And one small detail from around that time, and it's actually that ironic pin from earlier. Tommy Robinson was actually denied a visa for a trip to America because of that cocaine conviction. But he decided he wanted to go anyway, so he booked a flight <laughs> and traveled there using his friend's passport. So, so Tommy Robinson, the avowed crusader against illegal immigration, <laughs> entered the US illegally. <laughs> and upon arrival in New York, they fingerprinted him and immediately and obviously realized he was using someone else's passport. But he actually somehow managed to evade arrest while in the airport, left the airport and traveled home the next day using his own passport, at which point he was finally arrested by UK police. <laughs> we should deport him to Rwanda, right? He'd be on board with that. <laughs> yeah, right? In that trial, his lawyer tried to argue that Tommy only used the fraudulent passport for one day. And then the judge was like, yeah, but unfortunately you crossed an international border that day. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's the crime, idiot. Awful coincidence. Could happen to any of us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but oddly, his own passport, it doesn't list his name as Stephen Yaxley Lennon or obviously as Tommy Robinson. It lists his name as Paul Harris. And it is genuinely unclear why. Nobody seems to know why his official passport lists that as his name. Also, he has two passports because, as I pointed out before, his mum is an Irish immigrant, which entitles him to dual nationality. He's got an Irish passport and a member of the EU at that. Although his most recent use of that passport to flee the country has now raised some questions as to whether that passport is even valid because his place of birth in the passport is just listed as Ireland. Uh, well, really? no, that's, no, that's fine. Mine just says the West, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got one for New World and one for Old World. <laughs> So despite all of that, his credibility was rising still in certain circles. In 2014, a mere two years after we discovered that he had specifically inspired a neo-Nazi terrorist, he was invited to give a speech at the Oxford Union about defending free speech while posh Oxbridge kids playing edgy on daddy's money nodded along because authentic racists like Tommy Robinson will always find allies in the English upper classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back when I was at college, those kids were having their meetings in like secret underground lairs and stuff. I can't decide if that's better or worse. Hmm. It's horrible either way. Fairly sure a lot of Oxford colleges do have secret underground lairs. They're very old buildings. Yeah, it feels like Secret. they got plenty of those. They're doing both. In 2017, while trying to demonstrate that Muslim pedophiles were treated like they're above the law, Tommy Robinson turned up to a courtroom to take videos of defendants in a rape trial while yelling to them and to the jury entering the courtroom about their guilt. And he was arrested for contempt of court because publishing videos like that during an ongoing trial is illegal in the UK because it jeopardizes the right to a fair trial. Yeah. Which was exactly what Tommy's goal was. Because according to his plans, if he was disruptive enough to have the whole trial to be ruled as a mistrial, he could then claim that the legal system is so soft on Muslim pedophiles. <sighs> and then maybe his followers would then take drastic actions that he'd been kind of hinting at. 
Ugh. Yeah, so, so he's basically taking a page out of the Republicans. Government doesn't work. Let me show you playbook. Yeah, yeah. exactly that. Thing is, Tommy Robinson had friends in the right places by this point. So that contempt of court arrest was seen as a threat to press fe- freedom by people who have absolutely no idea how crime reporting works in the UK. He was celebrated by free speech warriors around the world. He appeared on InfoWars. He was even interviewed by Tucker Carlson on Fox News, where he was pretending to be Ah, silenced. Fucking course he was. His followers were encouraged in solidarity to tweet hashtag I am Tommy Robinson, which again is one of those ironies, given that Tommy (laughs) Robinson literally isn't Tommy Robinson. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like irony is lost on anyone watching the I'm being silenced tour, though. Really? (laughs) If you're smashing the like and subscribe button for the guy being silenced channel. Yeah. You deserve to be funding somebody's coke habit. That's not you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So while building a name for himself as a free speech grifter, Robinson and his team were also building a following in less visible places, such as Telegram. When in 2020, a lot of confused and scared people turned to alternative sources of information and misinformation about COVID, Tommy smelled opportunity and began to pump out anti-vaccine talking points. In those anti-vax groups, you were literally never more than a couple of scrolls away from a message that came from Tommy Robinson's channel. I spent a lot of time in the pandemic watching those groups and witnessing that. He was posting anti-vax narratives literally hundreds of times a day. Yeah, unchecked replication is a real big problem for anti-vaxxers, as it turns out. (laughs) (laughs) And contact tracing for Tommy Robinson when the (laughs) authorities look at the contact list. Pretty sure the police have got that now, yes. Pretty sure the police are doing that this last couple of weeks. (laughs) Thing is, this was the first time that Tommy Robinson had ever shown any interest in anti-vax rhetoric. So one of two things must have happened. Either Tommy Robinson became an avowed anti-vaxxer literally overnight, but then never mentioned it in any interviews or public appearances. Or he and his team realized that if you feed anti-vaxxers the content that they want, you can train them to trust you as a source of news and then you can convert them into subscribers and loyal followers. Mm -hmm. But to keep them following, you have to keep posting things that they like. So his channel became a clearinghouse for all manner of conspiracy theories, including, coincidentally enough, heavily pro-Russian propaganda about the invasion of Ukraine. But most of all, he posted about how we're being invaded by fighting age Muslim refugees and how white people's entire way of life was now under threat. Well, I I guess everybody's fighting age once you attack them. So, right. Yeah, sure. Robinson was also at that time dealing with another legal headache because he'd claimed that a 16 year old Syrian refugee had attacked two schoolgirls, but he was lying about that. And as a result of his lies, that kid was very badly beaten up and his family had to relocate as a result of the death threats he was getting from Tommy Robinson's followers. So the boy sued Robinson and he won. And Tommy Robinson admitted his entire story was a lie. He was told by the courts to pay £600,000 in damages and legal fees to the boy and to never repeat those lies about him. Okay. Hey, congrats, Tommy. You finally got silenced for real (laughs) about one sentence that you can't say, one particular lie. Yeah, you'd think so. (laughs) First of all, rather than pay the money, he declared bankruptcy and hasn't paid a cent of it. But then he made a documentary about the story, repeating the story that he'd already admitted was fake. And then worse than that, he organized a rally in London on July 27th of this year, so just a few weeks ago, where he screened his documentary filled with lies he's not allowed to make anymore to 30,000 people, breaking his court order along the way. And rather than turn up to a high court hearing on the 29th of July, he attempted to flee the country on that Irish passport and was duly arrested at the Channel Tunnel. (laughs) But again, because he's a white guy with all the legal privilege that brings, the police actually let him go as long as he promised what? to return for a new court date in October. Okay, but but the passport trick didn't work when nobody was looking for him. Why the fuck would he think it would work <laughs> now? <laughs> I thought we were all doing Spartacus together, guys. Uh, God uh, damn it. Uh, I am. So while Tommy Robinson was away on holiday, three children were murdered in Southport. Tommy and his team went into overdrive, sharing lies that the murderer was a Muslim immigrant and directing people to gather at a vigil for the murdered girls. The infrastructure that he'd been building through COVID conspiracism and training to respond to great replacement dog whistles duly obeyed. And when his channel amplified further lies about a planned Muslim attack on the vigil, which was not true, all hell broke loose. Over the coming days, 
Tommy Robinson would share lists of targets to attack, including mosques, asylum charities, immigration lawyers, and refugee processing centers. And he did all of this from a luxury resort in Cyprus, where he and his family were holidaying while he fled the authorities at home. And when news of his holiday were published in the papers, a very visibly twitchy Tommy published a Twitter video claiming that he had photos of the wife and children of the journalist who wrote the story and that he'd come after them if any more stories were printed. Okay, so I I know that's egregious and probably really traumatic for the dude and and his family, but what a stupid threat. (laughs) Once I'm done never setting foot on British soil again, lest I get arrested for my crimes, I'm coming after you. I'm going to (laughs) just... Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. And to admit it on Twitter as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. right, right. I watched that video on Twitter. It's six minutes long, and he swallows about a pint of leftover cocaine dripping from his nose oh, to the back Jesus. of his throat. It's just yeah. so much cocaine right before he started this video. His veins are throbbing so much. Yeah. Yeah, completely. He checks to make sure his teeth are still there about like once every 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> So while Tommy Robinson claims he had nothing to do with any of this, those claims are hard to make with a straight face because rioters were chanting his name as they kicked their way into Muslim-owned buildings. And just two days after he appeared on Infowars, where he said his role was to, quote, keep pouring petrol on the fire, his followers tried to set fire to two separate hotels filled with refugee families. That's unlikely to be a coincidence. The race riots in the UK were not the fault of one person, but it is pretty fair to say they likely wouldn't have happened without Tommy Robinson. Yeah, and Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson and everyone you know who smells like horse paste and goes on Telegram (laughs) except for Marsh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Tommy Robinson is an anti-immigrant son of immigrants. He's a campaigner against illegal border crossings who's banned from the US for illegally crossing the border. And he's a protector of women and children who's convicted for stalking and threatening women and children. And for relentlessly pushing COVID conspiracy theories and then spinning them into racist great replacement fears before unleashing them onto the streets of the UK, there is definitely a space in who's woo for Tommy Robinson or Stephen Yaxley Lennon or (laughs) Paul Harris or whoever this fucker actually is. (laughs) Hashtag I am wanking. That that one. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah, there's a, there's a place for him and way worse things than this segment. So thanks for sharing. And here's hoping you have another comparatively lighthearted story of a guy freezing people to death for money or something for the next installment of Who's Woo? Before we bring this one in for a landing, I want to remind you that if you love Marsh and you want to thank him in person for all the humor and knowledge that he's brought into your life, QED is just around the corner. The best skeptical conference in the world is October 19th and 20th in Manchester, England. The lineup this year is absolutely stacked. And who knows, you might even run into Heath, Eli, Lucinda, Anna, or myself while you're there. Be sure to check the show notes for a link to learn more and to buy your tickets today. Anyway, that's all the blessing we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 Eastern on Monday, and an even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't shut the fuck up until I thank Heath Enright for always writing the ship, Michael Marshall for always marshalling the forces, Eli Bosnick for being off this week so that I can make that bit work. Names like Bosnick don't really lend themselves to that kind of wordplay. I also want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Delusions, who's feeling much better this week. Still not 100%, but she's feeling much better. I also want to thank Shy Pirate for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. And I want to reiterate the message. Register or check to make sure you're registered because a lot of motherfuckers have gotten purged. And vote. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most scintillating citizens. Randall, Richard, Robert, Paul, Andrew, West, Charlotte, Other, Paul, Dot Log, Lilith, 210, and Beetlejuice. Randall, Richard, Robert, and Paul, whose cocks were uncredited extras in Anacondas. Andrew West, Charlotte, and other Paul, whose crowd sizes Trump is also jealous of. And A. Log, Lilith, 210, and Beetlejuice, who are so brainy, Pinky asks them what they want to do tonight. Together, these 11 people, stars, and files that sound a lot like trucker logbooks when you say them out loud, helped keep our puns profitable this week by giving us money. 
Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode. Or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not in a financial way, you can help a ton by leaving us a five star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Robinson handles that for us. Our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. I knew that you don't even have to leave your old contacts behind. You can keep your existing yes, contacts. Yes. You don't even have to change other people's phone numbers when you switch. <laughs> <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.